This is lesson number four in a series of 24 lessons on the case for biblical Christianity or Christian evidences, also sometimes referred to as Christian apologetics. Remember that our course is divided into four areas. Number one, God or God's existence. Number two, God's work. Number three, God's word. And number four, God's son. In the previous lesson, I presented some of the evidences that monotheism or the concept that there is one God is the oldest concept about God. In a great book entitled Eternity in Their Hearts by Don Richardson, Mr. Richardson points out some of the evidences concerning this. This book was published by the Regal Books Company, and my copy is a 1983 edition. It contains 176 pages. Mr. Richardson is also the author of other books. He is recognized for his anthropological or study of mankind and linguistic work among the Stone Age Sawi peoples of Iran Jaya in the Far East. The thesis of the Eternity in Their Hearts book is that ancient cultures believed in the one true and living God and had different names for him. Some of these names are still used in the modern forms of these cultures. For example, the Greeks referred to God as Theos, and this is uh, true even in modern Greek. Even though Theos was used as a general term for any deity, as man is used not referring to a certain person, uh, the word theos was also used in the Bible, in the New Testament, to refer to the true and living God. But the Greeks used theos to refer to the one true and living God even before the time of the New Testament. Three of the greatest philosophers of all time, Xenophanes, Plato, and Aristotle, used this word theos as a personal name for the one supreme God in their writings. And I suggest that you see Mr. Richardson's book, Eternity in Their Hearts, on page 22 for some good documentation on that, uh, that statement. Uh, Mr. Richardson also cites the Encyclopedia Britannica the 15th edition, volume 13, page 951, and volume 14, page 538, as proof that the Greeks, even before the time Jesus came into the world, used the word theos not only to refer to heathen deities, but also to refer to the one true and living God. He points out that in the South American area, the Incas, and these also lived in the North Amer on the North American continent, but the Incas, the people known as the Incas, sometimes referred to as the Inca Indians, used the name Veracocha, and they meant by this name the Lord, the Omnipotent One, the creator of all things. Mr. Richardson also points out that the Santal people of India used the name Thakur Giyu, which meant, in their language, the genuine God. The Chinese and the Koreans used the word Shang-Ti and Henanim, and these two names among the Chinese and Korean peoples still means the Lord of heaven. 
and they refer to the one true and living God in using these terms. Don Richardson, Richardson also says on page 64, and I'm going to quote him here, some scholars speculate that Shang-Ti may even be related linguistically to the Hebrew term Shaddai, as in El Shaddai, the Almighty. In Korea, he is known as Hananim, the Great One. Belief in Shang-Ti Henanim predates Confucianism, Taoism, and Buddhism by an unknown number of centuries. In fact, according to the Encyclopedia of Religion and Ethics, volume 6, page 272, the first reference in Chinese history to any kind of religious belief specifies Shang-Ti alone as the object of that belief. The antiquity of that reference, an estimated 2,600 years before Christ. And I'm still reading from Mr. Don Richardson in his book, Eternity in Their Hearts, and this is on page 64. And I make a comment here to remind you how far back this is, 2600 B.C. That was five or six hundred years before the time of Abraham. And so he goes on to say the 2600 years B.C. is more than 2,000 years before Confucianism or any other structured religion arose in China. Worshippers throughout both China and Korea seem to have understood from the beginning that Shang-Ti, Henanim, must never be represented by idols. Chinese people, for their part, appear to have paid homage to Shang-Ti quite freely until the dawn of the Shu dynasty, 1066 to 770 B.C. By that time, Chinese religious leaders, zealous to emphasize Shang-Ti's majesty and holiness, gradually lost sight of his love and mercy toward men. And of course this means, and I'm commenting on what Mr. Richardson says here now, this means that they corrupted the original idea of the true and living God, the God who revealed himself to men through the heads of the families, even before the time of Moses, in what is known as the patriarchal system or patriarchal age. Then Mr. Richardson goes on to say, soon they worked themselves into a corner so constricted that only the emperor was deemed good enough to worship Shang-Ti, and that only once a year. Common people from that time forward, were forbidden to pay homage to their Creator directly. Father Emperor would take care of everything they were told. And when we read in the Old Testament, in Genesis chapter 14, something very interesting along this line. Now we want to remember that Abraham lived five or six hundred years before the time of Moses. And he was known as Abram at first, according to the Genesis record. And when Abram returned from a battle with some of the kings of that time, as reported in Genesis chapter 14, he met a king who was also priest of the Most High God, known as Melchizedek. And Don Richardson wrote concerning this meeting on pages 7 and 8 of his book, Eternity in Their Hearts, a very interesting comment. And I do recommend that you get this book, Eternity in Their Hearts. I believe that all missionaries should have a copy of this book so they will understand better the cultures into which they may go carrying the good news of the true and living God, and to show some acquaintance with the names used by 
the peoples all over the earth in ancient times and even on into modern times, referring to the one true and living God, would certainly be helpful. We must remember that the word G-O-D is a relatively new word compared to some of these names which predate Old English by hundreds and hundreds of years. The word G-O-D being an Anglo-Saxon name or, as we say, English name. But uh, that means, of course, since the English language did not come into existence, for many hundreds of years even after the New Testament was written. And certainly many hundreds of years after the Old Testament was written, and yet we are reading about names for the one true and living God that precede even the time of Moses and even the time of Abraham. And these cultures were acquainted with the one true and living God. And that, of course, confirms the things that I have already stated in this course concerning how God revealed Himself to man. And then, of course, oftentimes man corrupted the concept that God presented concerning Himself. But Mr. Richardson wrote concerning this meeting between Melchizedek and Abram in these words, Sure enough, Abram had no sooner arrived in this valley of the king when King Melchizedek himself brought out bread and wine for Abram's refreshment. The narrator does not say that Melchizedek journeyed to meet Abram, and by narrator, remember, he's referring to the writer of Genesis, Moses. So the narrator does not say that Melchizedek journeyed to meet Abram bearing bread and wine, but that he simply brought out bread and wine. Perhaps another evidence for the close proximity of the valley of Shaveh and Salem. Now comes the unexpected. This Canaanite king of righteousness, according to the author of Genesis, doubled also as priest of El Elyon, or as the English text says in Genesis 14, 18, God Most High. Who was El Elyon? Both El, that's spelled E-L in English, both El and Elyon were Canaanite names for Yahweh Himself. Now note this, and he gives the proof of this as we go just a little farther in this reading from Mr. Richardson. El occurs frequently in ancient Ugaritic texts, and he cites and documents that. This Canaanite name, El, even worked its way into the Hebrew language of Abram's descendants in such words as Bethel, the house of God, El Shaddai, God Almighty, and Elohim, God, a pluralized form of El which nevertheless retains a mysteriously singular meaning. Elyon now note Mr. Richardson's comment on this name Elyon. Elyon likewise shows up as a name for God in ancient texts written in Phoenician, a later branch of Melchizedek's old Canaanite language. And even the compound from El Elyon appears in an ancient Aramaic inscription found recently in Syria. Compounded together, the two terms El and Elyon mean something like the most God, God. In other words, emphasizing the greatness and the oneness of God, or the God who is really God, 
translators usually render it, God Most High. Now the point here is that Abram accepted this name, El Elyon, who was the god of Melchizedek. And Mr. Richardson goes on to say and raises the question, did Abram, the Chaldean accustomed to calling the Almighty Yahweh, balk at Melchizedek's use of this Canaanite El Elyon as a valid name for God? We do not have to wait for an answer. For Melchizedek did something which put Abram's attitudes to the test immediately. Melchizedek blessed Abram, saying, Blessed be Abram by El Elyon, creator of heaven and earth, and blessed be El Elyon, who delivered Abram's enemies into his hand. And that's from Genesis chapter 14, verses 19 and 20. And in this reading, El Elyon, the original word of the Hebrew text, is not translated with Most High God, but is left just El Elyon, which of course really is not Hebrew, but originally Canaanite language, as he points out here, referring to the one true and living God. But now notice Mr. Richardson's next comment. Brace yourself for Abram's reply. We may be about to listen in on the first theological argument in the history of mankind. The correct name, no, I'm sorry, I go back and don't want to miss a line because it's very important that we see this. What will Abram say after Melchizedek has blessed him and called upon the El Elyon, or this one or most high God, to bless him, using the Canaanite name, Notice, what will Abram say? What will be his response? Will he say, one moment, your highness. The correct name for the Almighty is Yahweh, not El Elyon. Furthermore, I cannot accept a blessing offered under the Canaanite name El Elyon since your Canaanite concept of the Almighty undoubtedly must be tainted with pagan notions. In any case, Yahweh has told me that I am the one who is supposed to bless you. <clears throat> don't, don't you think, <clears throat> excuse me, don't you think you have been a little presumptuous in blessing me? Isn't that interesting? Abraham didn't say any of these things that Mr. Richardson presents as though he could have replied like this, but he didn't reply like this. No, he didn't re reply like this. He didn't rebuke Melchizedek for using the Canaanite name for the one true and living God, even though they had misunderstandings concerning the one true and living God. It was a legitimate name for the one true and living God. Abram's response, Mr. Richardson goes on to say, Abram's response was to give Melchizedek a tenth of everything, which was recovered from Kedalo Omar in the rescue operation, according to Genesis chapter 14 and verse 20. I think this is most interesting because it shows that even Abram, who was later known or called Abraham, accepted the name El Elyon as, the, as a name for the one true and living God. And then, of course, 
We read in other ancient literature about many other names for this one true and living God, and some modern names for God in various cultures and languages are certainly different to our name, G-O-D. For example, if you were in France and speaking French, you would not use the word God to refer to God our Father in heaven. You would use the word Deu. And if you were in Spain, you would use the word Dios, D-I-O-S. And if you were in an Arabic land, among the Muslim peoples, you would hear the word Allah, used to refer to the one true and living God. And linguists tell us that Allah is the Arabic form of Hebrew Elohim. So, Elohim, El Elyon, Allah, these are all names used in various languages to refer to the same supreme being, the one true and living God. Just as he's referred to in French, Deu, in Spanish, Deus, in German, Gott, G-O-T-T, -T. and the Boule language of West Africa is where they call this same one true and living God, Niamia. Now, I might be mispronouncing it compared to the way they pronounce it, but it's N-Y-A-M-I-A. -A. This is very interesting because we need to be aware of how this one true and living God has been recognized and is still recognized in the cultures of the world as the one true and living God. There is no historical evidence that man was long time on the earth before he was aware of the one true and living God. It is nothing more than a myth for modernists and liberals to say that man gradually developed the concept of God and made up this concept, and it took him ages to do so in his evolutionary development. Now, you can believe that if you want to, but you'll be, you will be believing a myth. You will be disregarding the facts of history and the overwhelming evidence that man has never been on the earth without a concept of the one true and living God. No history suggests that there was ever a time when human beings did not have the concept of the one true and living God. There are those who say they would believe in God if they could see Him. Now that's a rather remarkable attitude. They would believe in God if they could see Him. It may be startling to some to hear what I'm about to say, and that is the fact we do not see Him, can be viewed as great evidence He really does exist. I want to show you why I say that, and I want you to be able to tell others. And that's one of the purposes of these lessons, not only to help those who hear the tapes, watch the tapes, watch the lessons, but to be able to use these ideas in helping others to be fortified in their faith or to generate faith, to strengthen faith. Joe, just think about what I've just said. The fact we do not see God can be viewed as evidence He really does exist. 
The first question for us to consider as we think about this is you have the concept of God in your mind. Where did you get it? You will likely respond and say, <clears throat> my mother taught me this concept. Well, probably that's true. Maybe your mother and your father or brothers and sisters could have done it. But the next question is, where did they get the concept? They didn't just sit down and think it up, did they? No, they got it from others, people preceding them by age. Caused them to have this concept. And you see, you can just go right on, and it doesn't matter how far back you go, you can still raise the question, where did he get the concept of God? Our concepts come into our minds through our five senses. These are sight, touch, smell, taste, and hearing. Can you conceive of or create a concept of something that does not exist? Now, before you hasten to say you can, you'd better think about that a while. Have you ever done it? Now, I'm not saying you cannot concoct some kind of a concept of something by using things that are already here and taking parts of many things and combining them. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about your coming up with something that does not exist. Just make up a concept of something that does not exist. I think you'll find that rather difficult. Try it and see. And let me know if you do come up with a concept of something that doesn't exist. If God does not exist, as some say, and yet even they have the concept of Him, if God does not exist, the concept of Him did not come into some ancient person's mind through sight or touch or smelling or taste or hearing. For if He does not exist, certainly nobody saw Him, nobody touched Him, Nobody smelled him, nobody tasted of him, and nobody heard him, if he does not exist. But people do have this concept, and even though they get the concept or got the concept from others, the question remains, where did the others get it? And go back as far as you please. Somebody had to have it to start with. I maintain that we're forced by reason and logic, as well as Scripture, to believe that God made Himself known and that that is the way that concept came into man's mind originally. And if not, how did it get into his mind? God had to reveal Himself to man, starting, of course, as the Bible teaches, with Adam and Eve, whom he created as the first human beings. Now, if you have difficulty believing in something that you cannot see, I think you can remove that problem by just thinking some about this matter. We believe in many things that we cannot see. If someone says, Draw me a picture of God and I will believe. Then you might ask that person to draw you a picture of his mind. You've never seen a picture of anybody's mind, even if you saw the, a picture of a person's brain. You would not be seeing his mind. And we've already talked about 
and studied about this some in this course. Ask him to draw you a picture of consciousness. Have you ever seen consciousness? Ask him to draw you a picture of an idea. I realize that a person might draw something concerning an idea that he has in his mind, but he cannot draw his own idea, and nobody else can draw his idea or anyone's ideas. They are unseen. And have you ever seen a picture of life? You have seen manifestations of life, but nobody has ever seen life as great and wonderful and powerful as it is. Nobody has ever seen life. Have you ever seen a picture of memory? Or have you ever seen memory? You really haven't. Have you ever seen love? You really haven't, except the actions of love. But the abstract element known as love is not to be seen. It is manifested in various ways, that's true, but it is not seen. And hate is not seen except in the manifestations of it, what it brings about, and how ugly it can cause people to act. But hate itself is an unseen entity or matter. And so we do not believe that we have to see everything in order to believe in things. We believe in things that we do not see. And so it is with God, the evidence is overwhelming that God really does exist. Something else, that is the fact that I am talking and that you're hearing me talk is evidence that God exists. I am evidence that God exists as a human being. I cannot be explained without God. And the fact that I'm talking is evidence that God exists. For we are told by the experts that a child which cannot hear will not learn to talk. Now some that have been deaf have learned to talk some, but they had to feel the vibrations and get them into their system some way in order to reproduce them. So the experts tell us you cannot learn to talk without hearing. Now, if that is true and we cannot change that with all our modern technology and scientific advances, what about the first baby? How did it learn to talk? Even if it evolved, which it didn't, but what if you look back in history and could go back as far, so far that you could discover the first baby human being, when there was no human being for it to listen to? How did it learn to talk? I believe that God Almighty made the first human beings so they could talk from the very beginning. Either that or they could learn to talk by listening to Him. I think the evidence is that God made them so they could talk to start with, that He made them mature, functioning beings. And we'll look into that more when we get into God's work. But God is evident everywhere. And even though we do not see Him, there are overwhelming evidences of his existence. Now it's well for us to know all of these wonderful indications that God exists. And it ought to be overwhelming to anyone who thinks about it. But it is also well for us to know more about him. Now we can look out in nature and realize that there is a supreme being. But we can't tell from nature who the supreme being is or who the supreme or what the supreme power may be. 
or how many beings or powers there may be. So God not only revealed Himself, He also told us about Himself. He presented many of the traits and characteristics of Himself right in the book that He wrote about Himself, and that is the Bible, the Word of God. And when we get to the place in our course where we'll study the Bible itself and the evidences that the Bible is indeed the Word of God, then I'll tell you more about why I believe the Bible. But let's just look at the Bible itself for a while and see some of the traits and characteristics that God has presented concerning Himself. And after all, even though there are those who say they do not believe the Bible, none of them has ever proven that what it says about God or anything else is untrue. It behooves us, therefore, to accept what it says. It hasn't been disproven. Nobody has proven that what it says is not dependable. What it says about God is untrue, or what it says about anything else is untrue. So let's think about what it says about God in various categories. We'll note some scriptures, not all of them by any means, on any one of these particular subjects concerning God, but we'll notice some scriptures under each of the headings I'll, to which I'll call your attention. The first area we want to note is the eternity of God. In Genesis chapter 21 and verse 33, the Bible says, And Abraham planted a grove in Beersheba, and called there on the name of the Lord the everlasting God. This is a reference to the eternal being known as Almighty God. In Deuteronomy 32 and verse 40, we're told that God said, I lift up my hand to heaven and say, I live forever. In Deuteronomy 33, 27, the eternal God is thy refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. And in Job chapter 36 and verse 26, the Bible says, Neither can the number of his years be searched out. God is eternal. I know that's a difficult concept, but we cannot reject it merely because we in our finite, limited capacities cannot grasp it. The evidence is overwhelming that He does exist, and He tells us that He is eternal. The number of His years cannot be searched out. In Psalm 41, 13, we're told, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel from everlasting to everlasting. And in Psalm chapter 90, and verse 1, Lord, Thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever Thou hadst formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, Thou art God. A thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday, when it is past, and as a watch in the night. Now, no one has ever proven that that isn't true concerning our everlasting God. Psalm 93 and verse 2, Thy throne is established of old. Thou art from everlasting, Micah chapter 2, 5 and verse 2 repeats the same sentiment. Psalm 102 and verse 12. Thou, O Lord, 
shalt endure forever, and thy remembrance unto all generations. Thy years are throughout all generations. Of old hast thou laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thy hands. They shall perish, meaning the work of his hands will perish, but thou shalt endure. They shall perish, but thou shalt endure, yea, all of them shall wax old like a garment, as a vesture shalt thou change them and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years shall have no end. Not only do we read in the Bible that God is eternal, that he is from everlasting to everlasting, we also read that he is infinite. As in 1 Kings chapter 8 and verse 27, the writer said, Will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold the heaven, and heaven of heavens cannot contain thee. How much less this house that I have builted, and that is comparable to Second Chronicles chapter 2, verses, verse 6, and also chapter 6 and 1 and 18, where emphasis is given on how the earth, even the universe, the heaven of the heavens, cannot contain this infinite God, this great and marvelous Spirit about which we are studying. Psalm 147, verse 5. Great is our Lord, and of great power His understanding is infinite. Jeremiah 23, verse 24. Do not I fill heaven and earth, saith the Lord? He is so great, beloved, we cannot use adequate terminology and figures and forms of speech to really show what he is like. Even the writers of the Bible guided by the Holy Spirit, adapting the language to the human concept and understanding of matters, does not show us completely what God is really like. He is so overwhelming and so great. He cannot be contained. He cannot be defined. He cannot be put in limitations. And so these writers, realizing that by the power of the Holy Spirit, they wrote concerning this great and marvelous infinite God. In Isaiah chapter 55 and verse 8, in the midst of the idolatry of the times among God's people, which is described in the first chapter of Isaiah, there was a great need for God in the minds of the people of God. As Isaiah tells us, just like there is a great need today, and many of the problems of Isaiah's time are being repeated in our own time, and for the same reason, God is being left out of our lives too much. And here Isaiah tells us that God Almighty said of himself, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. What a mighty contrast. We cannot conceive adequately of the heavens and how high they are. But whatever they are, they are higher than the earth just as God's thoughts are higher than our thoughts. <clears throat> and God's ways are higher than our ways in the same way. 1 Corinthians 2.16 For who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? 
And so God is infinite. We further note in the Bible that God is unsearchable and incomprehensible. And I love Isaiah's words on this great God and how incomprehensible and unsearchable He is. And I read from Isaiah 40, beginning in verse 12. Who hath measured the waters in the hollow of His hand, and meted out heaven with the span, and comprehended the dust of the earth in a measure, and weighed the mountains in scales, and the hills in a balance. There's a question mark after that statement. That is a question. And it is a powerful question indeed, a challenging question. And of course the answer to it is the Almighty. God Almighty is the one who measured the waters in the hollow of His hand, Figurative language, certainly, showing how great and powerful and majestic and wonderful our God is. He knows even the measure of the waters. And the earth is more than three-fourths covered with water, we're told. We can't really conceive of how much water that is, but the Lord knows all about it. And Isaiah goes on to say, who hath directed the Spirit of the Lord, or being His counselor hath taught Him? That's another question. And of course the obvious answer is, nobody has. <clears throat> and yet it is startling to hear somebody sitting in judgment, as it were, on God Almighty. And sometimes people say what God should do and what God shouldn't do and try to give him advice. Oh, my friends, we ought to be very careful never to do that because we cannot direct him. We cannot give him advice. We cannot teach him. We cannot tell him what he should do and what he shouldn't do and be right. And then he goes on and raises another question. With whom took he counsel? And who instructed him and taught him in the path of judgment and taught him knowledge and showed to him the way of understanding? And of course the answer to that, nobody. Behold, the nations are as a drop of a bucket. You may have wondered where that expression came from. Perhaps this is the place. A drop of a bucket. The nations are as a drop of a bucket and are counted as the small dust of the balance. Behold, he taketh up the isles as a very little thing. Can you imagine dust on a balance? And that, was, that refers to a weighing instrument, a balance, whether it is exactly like what we see now I'm not certain, but a little amount of dust on the balance wouldn't make it unfair to use it enough to be concerned about. And he's saying here that that's a mighty little thing, the dust of the balance. But he says the nations to God Almighty and compared to Him, the nations are as a drop of a bucket and are counted as the small dust of the balance. Behold, if he, behold, he taketh up the isles as a very little thing, and Lebanon is not sufficient to burn, nor the beasts thereof sufficient for a burnt offering. All nations before him are as nothing. And here... In a very strong statement, a hyperbolical statement, emphasizing even allowable exaggeration, and they are counted to him less than nothing and vanity. Compared to Almighty God, the nations are less than nothing. 
Beloved, the nations of the earth need to recognize this. And when we begin to become proud as a nation, we must hasten to remember that compared to the Almighty who made us and who made the nations and all the universe, we are nothing. To whom, then, will ye liken God? Or what likeness will ye compare unto Him? Isaiah asks. Thank you very much.